Okay, so uh, we have two, two reasons today. Uh, one is to um, recognise the excellence of some of our engaged researchers. And the second one is to launch the second running of our Engagement Research Awards scheme. So the, uh, the first time we ran this uh, was earlier in this year, and uh, we planned on uh, giving three awards. Uh, we had three categories, one for research leaders, one for early career researchers, and one for postgraduate researchers. Um, and the applications we received were such high quality that we decided to extend it. Uh, so we actually gave seven awards, which was a lovely thing for us to be able to do, and, and they are represented here. Um, and you're going to hear from uh, five of the award winners uh, today. I'll just note the two that aren't here, because you can hear from the rest. Um, so Joe Smith, uh, who's great for climate, uh, unfortunately can't be here today, and Pete Wood, um, who's done a, working on a PhD in Southwark, looking at cycling schemes in Southwark, which he worked with in an engaged way. So there are two, if you like, that aren't missing. Um, and over here, we have Nick Mahoney here, who uh, up to recently was based in social sciences, uh, who has represented our wonderful Enduring Love project. Uh, so you have Jackie Gabb, um, who's going to speak uh, on the podium in a moment. Um, so yes, the whole idea of the scheme was to say to reward and recognise people who do this kind of work well. Um, and one of the challenges we had in uh, looking at this was setting up a set of criteria that allow us to do that. So as uh, we did, we uh, did a trawl across universities to, to have a look at different criteria, and we found none at least none that people were willing to share with us. So we effectively had to make up our own. Um, and what we do on our blog here is kind of share those. So if people want to have a look at what we use to assess the, assess the quality of the awards in the first instance, you can have a look at it there online. OK, so we've got five speakers. I shall not speak for no longer, because I want to hand over to the experts here. And I'm going to start with Thea, who's from the Institute of Educational Technology. Over to you, Thea. Thank you, Well, hello, I'm uh, Thea Hirododu. I'm working at the Institute of Educational Technology. And today I'm going to um, talk you through the Enquire project and how we engage um, people, the public, into research. Uh, among the work that we are doing at the Institute of Educational Technology is the design of educational tools uh, that will facilitate and support learning in formal and informal settings. Uh, specifically, uh, well, I work on a research program uh, that aims to engage the public and especially young people who lack interest in science, technology, engineering and math in doing science investigations. Uh, through the use of mobile and web-based applications and hands-on activities. Uh, we aim to help them better understand the big issues of society, access science careers and develop a personal sense of wonder. Uh, our approach is framed under the concept of a citizen inquiry, uh, which is a combination between inquiry science learning and citizen science. Uh, inquiry science learning refers to the process of formulating questions, testing hypotheses, collecting and analyzing data, and concluding. Uh, while citizen science uh, is a popular paradigm of doing research, where non-professional members of the public uh, collaborate with scientists in order to collect uh, data and analyze data. Uh, so they actually help scientists in doing their research. Uh, citizen science, though, faces certain challenges. Uh, the first one is how to extend it to a young population who is found to be disinterested in science education. At the moment, most, peop most people involved in citizen science are middle-aged individuals, so young people are still missing from this approach. And the second challenge that citizen science is facing relates to the general methodological approach they adopt, which at the moment is a top-down approach. Uh, that is, uh, we have scientists who define the research questions, they set the hypothesis, they decide the methods of data collection, and then we have the, the public that comes to only collect data and contribute data to these uh, initiatives. So there is a lack of engagement of the public uh, in all the stages of the scientific process. Um, as part of the Enquire Young Citizen Inquiry project, we tried to address these challenges. Um, first to say that the Enquire project is a one-year research and development project funded by Nominate Trust. 
Uh, the aims of the projects are to engage young people in designing and running scientific investigations. Uh, second, to design mobile applications that will give access to phone sensors on smartphones and tablets. Uh, then to evaluate those applications with students and teachers and connect the applications to new or existing citizen science projects. So what engagement means for this project for Enquire? It actually means two, thing, two things. The first thing uh, relates to the methodological design of Enquire. Uh, for us, uh, public engagement is perce perceived as a two-way process uh, where interaction and listening um, are core dimensions. Um, our aim is to have mutual benefit between participants and the research, te research team. Uh, so we try to engage participants in all stages of the research process uh, for the design, in our case, of mobile and web-based tools. Uh, specifically, participating teaching staff uh, propose the design of a specific tool for doing science, a sensor-based application. Uh, so based on their interests and their needs, we developed the specific tools. And secondly, participating students were our, were, have been our partners in designing, testing and sharing scientific investigations. So we work with, with them throughout the process of designing. So they give us feedback on how they want the tools to look like and uh, uh, give us um, feedback on uh, how we could improve them so they, uh, they fit their needs. Uh, for example, for the design of a mobile app, they proposed changes that related to navigation, simplicity, attractiveness. And also they proposed their own science investigations on a platform I'm going to show you in a bit. The second uh, aspect of engagement for Enquire relates to the design, the actual design of the tools and their affordances. Um, what I mean is that we design uh, online tools that try to bridge the gap between the scientists and the public and bring science a step closer to young people. Um, who young people have the opportunity to take part in knowledgeable communities of inquiry. Uh, they can exchange knowledge, knowledge and information between, uh, with science experts and scientists. Uh, science learning is guided by their own personal interests and um, the public, and in our case young people, act as scientific investigators. Uh, the Enquired Mission platform, platform is where we actually implemented all the approach I presented earlier. Uh, it's a mission-based platform where young people can propose can either propose their own missions or take part uh, in existing um, investigations. Uh, the platform supports the development and management of personal inquiry missions. Um, so someone that uh, joins the platform can create uh, uh, three types of missions. Sensitive missions that make use of mobile devices and uh, an application called Sensit that collects uh, information from the sensors available on phones and mobile devices. Spotted missions uh, make use of the camera, of the phone camera, and they collect data through images. Uh, for example, weird, weird signs found in the road could be an example mission, for example, spotted mission. And uh, winged missions are more text-based. They require a creative answer uh, to a real-life problem. For example, how can you attract bubble bees in gardens? Um, so any participant can either take part uh, in an existing uh, mission or propose their own mission. Uh, also, the platform scaffolds uh, the data collection and analysis practices. Um, you can preview the, the data you uploaded to the website, compare it to other users, and decide whether you like or not the uh, uh, data set by voting uh, positively or negatively. And it also supports uh, refle reflective practices and argumentation through comments, forum, and social network sites like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, overall, we try with this um, platform and with the general citizen inquiry approach uh, to 
make young people feel like scientists, um, allow them to take part to all the stages of the scientific process, from, the, from setting their own hypothesis, their own research question, to actually analyzing their data and contributing to a discussion around their mission. So in this way, we open up um, to young people uh, a space where they can actually experience all the stages of the scientific method. Thank you very much. That was my presentation. <laughs> Don't know if there are any time for questions. Any questions? Yeah. What do you think the biggest shift uh, there was between the version of NQR used with school children and with teachers? Um, what, what do you think is the biggest shift um, into this new missions platform? I think the bigger difference or shift is that uh, this platform is it, it tended to be used uh, informally uh, by any person, either being inside the school or outside of the school. And uh, the whole teaching process uh, is envisioned that will be facilitated by expert, uh, either expert users or um, expert scientists that will be willing to take part in the platform and support the learning process, the informal learning process. Actually, at the moment, uh, I have to say that the platform is still under de development. Uh, we designed the platform having in mind this framework of uh, inquiry research. So when you go to the create the function of the page, you can see that the first thing you're asked to do is to decide on a title and then decide on a research question and then how to collect data. So we actually try to put the same process into this platform, but, but in a more simple way, so it's more friendly and easier to be used by young people without the support of teachers, their teachers. Can I ask you two, two kind of related questions? One of which is, what, what was the biggest challenge of working in this way, uh, working in an engaged way? Uh, and what do you think was the biggest benefit? I think the biggest challenge that we are still trying to face is to find people, uh, get into the platform and um, try out the platform and suggest their own missions. Uh, to address this challenge, we collaborate with the British Science Association, uh, who have, uh, they have a great pool of young people that they would be willing to log into the platform and uh, give us their ideas. Uh, but I, I, I still think that it's a great challenge how to find people and make it the work and look like a community, a community of inquiry. And the second, the, the greatest benefit... Yeah, actually, you've answered both my questions. Yeah, I think. Do you think, I mean, just to follow up on that, do you think there's a kind of optimum size of community that you want to work with? I mean, I guess, oh. you know, you think of some of these kind of citizen science initiatives which talk about hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. being you know, registered. Um, but then there's the issue about how many of these people are active. You know I mean? Actually, we'd be happy if we could get uh, like a couple of hundred of yeah. uh, users on the platform because I think the more users we have, the more users we are going to get in the future because it's easier when you see activity on a platform and maybe when people create some missions that are really interesting, they will catch the attention of other people and they will start using the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll now, we'll now move on to Natalia, uh, who's based on the Faculty of Education and Language Studies. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, so I'm Natalia Kuchirkova. I'm currently working as a Knowledge Transfer Partnership Associate for the Open University and for Book Trust. And I guess there are various uh, levels or layers uh, to engaged research in the 21st century. So I'll be talking about what I understand under engaged research and how I use it in my own work. Um, so what you can see is two screenshots. One shows an um, app called Our Story, which was um, developed here at the Open University, very much drawing on my uh, postgraduate research. 
um, concerned with personalization and interactive book reading with young children. What the app does is that it allows parents uh, and other caregivers and young children to create their own stories based on pictures, their own texts, and also their own um, audio sounds. Uh, the app is available for free, can be downloaded from uh, uh, the App Store or also from the Google Market Store for Android devices. Um, I have seen the app being used in homes, but also in schools in the UK, but also elsewhere in uh, Spain, the US, Japan. And uh, we really found invariably that when children are given the opportunity to personalize um, their own stories, they become engaged in the process of reading and um, are really given the possibilities of sharing what they feel, what they think about, and it's a very unique process to, to study and research. Um, the What is That iBook was really a bit of an experiment, trying to look at um, how we can mesh and connect um, different apps together. It's an iBook where at the end, um, users are given the opportunity to create their own um, interactive book. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm currently working as a knowledge transfer partnership associate, which basically means that I'm trying to bridge um, academia and a little bit uh, the business world, or in my case, it's the charity world, because I'm working for uh, the Literacy Charity Book Trust, which is the largest um, literacy charity in the UK. Uh, you might know um, various book gifting schemes, and they are part of uh, programs um, such as Read for My School or Book Bus and Book Start, all these are part of, um, of Book Trust. Uh, part of the work I'm doing is looking at various children's apps and trying to come up with a um, rubric or a classification system which would allow us to really differentiate which apps are more educational than others. And also part of the work is um, contributing to the digital strategy of Book Trust because the organization as a whole is now going through a major transformation process. Um, so um, our team at the Open University, which is myself, um, Professor Teresa Kremin and um, Professor Karen Littleton, we are trying to look at the various ways um, how Book Trust could be part of this digital journey. And lastly, I wanted to mention that um, I think it's very important that researchers try to share um, what they know, but also try to listen to the public on a global scale and engage with them. So I've been engaged um, quite a lot in um, academic blogging on various platforms, including the conversation, and also regularly contributing to book trust research blogs or um, blogs of Children's Media Foundation. So I think I'll stop there so that um, you can ask any questions. Can I ask you, how did you, I mean, you've obviously moved into, you know, you've done a lot of engagement work in your PhD. Mm. Um, and now, as you said, you've kind of moved into just engagement also as kind of communication kind of fit. How did you make that kind of leap, if you like, Joe? I mean, how do you make that jump between postgraduate research and then into this kind of conversation. How did you do that? I think it's a lot about partnerships. So um, when I started as a postgraduate research, I couldn't really engage in uh, engaged research on a, a bigger scale. Uh, so what um, I was trying to do was to be involved more uh, with community projects, trying to pull together groups of um, teachers and various partners. So working for Booktress is really an um, invaluable opportunity to have access to various stakeholders. So not only um, parents, but also teachers, librarians, app developers through the Children's Media Foundation. So once you put all these various stakeholders together, I think that really allows us then to not only better understand them, but also um, better shape their thinking as well. So I think it's really about these partnerships. Would you say that, I mean, I was kind of curious, did you start out with this kind of engaged research process in mind when you were starting your PhD? Mm. Or was that something that you kind of negotiated with your supervisors? Did you take it to them? You know, how did that kind of interaction mm. play out, you know? Um, well, 
my research is very much at the intersection of psychology and education. So um, initially, when I started, it was a lot to do with um, kind of research on children rather than with them, um, because we were taking a very um, rigid scientific psychology approach, trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of personalization. Um, so there, the engagement with a wider public wasn't really possible. Um, but later on, when we're trying to understand the uh, various ways in which children can personalize their stories, including the digital medium, then it became really apparent that we need to talk to them, we need to really get various multiple perspectives on the issue. Can I ask, how, how do you go about measuring the, the impact of the, of the project and what you do? Um, well, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because many of the um, impact measures are um, not necessarily aligned with the intangible benefits we see. Um, I suppose it varies um, depending on the various elements of the project. So, um, say with the app, you could be looking at the number of downloads, um, but what is really important to us is not only that people downloaded it, but also how long they engaged with it and what they actually did with the app. Are they still using it? So is there a sustained engagement? How did it shape their thinking about um, reading in the digital age? So um, I think it's a lot about negotiation as well. So when we were thinking about how can we include our story um, in, a, in a ref impact study, it was thinking about, okay, so how many children did we reach and how did we really affect them? Um, so it was looking both at the numbers, but also uh, thinking about, can we get some um, quotes? Can we really interview people and ask them, how did it really change their perspectives and attitudes? Yeah. Okay, and um, so you, we, we chatted about this before, <laughs> before you did your concert, you know, before you did your piece. Mm -hmm. So I know you're a real enthusiast for this kind of approach. And you've mm -hmm. seen this kind of I'm kind of wondering, based on your experience of studying this as a postgraduate researcher and then moving into your kind of knowledge of transfer function, what advice you give to a supervisor who is approached by a student who might want to work in this kind of way and the supervisor perhaps isn't quite convinced? <laughs> what advice would you give to the, to the PhD student maybe who's thinking, mm. okay, I need to try and convince the supervisor that this is worth it, need to try? It's difficult because I... <laughs> Also, when I was asked to write a blog about engaged research, it was difficult for me because I was thinking, how can research be not engaged? You know, I just, I'm really not an advocate for this blue sky thinking research. To me, research needs to be done in conversation with the people we are trying to change their perspectives and attitudes. So, um, if there is a real clash in perspectives, I think uh, if I was a beginning PhD student, I would probably not attempt to <laughs> change that big. Uh, um, well, I suppose best way is to really model what we are trying to see in the world. So if a new starting PhD student is really enthusiastic about engaged research, then I would say go to places where this is possible and then perhaps engage <laughs> the other researchers by, by, by example. Yeah. Can I kind of repeat the question Rick asked earlier, Taya earlier? What do you think is the, the best thing that's come out of being a, a, your engaged research, you know, anecdotally or otherwise? What do you think has been the, the, something good that, that you couldn't have done otherwise if you hadn't been engaged? If you to mm. Well, I suppose it's my own understanding and also understanding of other people. So if this wasn't an engaged research, I think it would be very much a... Uh, you know, it's like a um, stagnated process, so we wouldn't be able to really develop with the newest trends in, in the digital sphere, which is very dynamic, um, very multifaceted. And it's really um, thanks to the power of engagement so that we can discuss and get the knowledge, well, almost really crowdsource the knowledge from others and then contribute what we know. I think it's only because of engaged research that we could, well, that we can be advancing the knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm. I'm just very struck by the um, equivalence between being an engaged researcher in this work and uh, being an HCI person who believes in participatory design. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the 
that there's a such a strong belief in that methodology mm -hmm. uh, from people who would not use the language of engaged research or not. Uh, so so I, I'm quite interested in how, I mean I can see coming from a sort of experimental psychological background, this is such a big shift. But if you had started off perhaps doing a PhD in educational technology or in uh, the HCI department in computing, you might well have used similar development methods because you would think that you would have to do that in developing the app. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I, I'm just quite interested in how you communicate with different co communities what engaged research is because if you ask an HCI person, they might say, no, engaged research, don't know about that. Mm. But if you mention participatory design, they're all signed up to it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm quite interested in how you flex that back to people. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think personally, because I traveled the journey myself, um, I think that helps me understand the various definitions people yeah. use and the various um, discourses. Um, and also having engaged directly with, say, psychology groups and knowing how they would label this kind of research uh, is very helpful now when I'm trying to communicate, look, this is what we found and these are the real benefits of um, doing participatory research um, and I think it's um, the possibility of being part of the creator process not necessarily at the consumer end which helps us understand what are also the uh, thinking processes of the app developers and how they may perceive it from their end mm -hmm. um, so I don't know whether that answers your question a little bit <laughs> it was more like a common thing, yeah. No, I, think the, I think the point about the creative aspect is very important. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the moment we are trying really to understand what the children themselves think about the design of apps and what they would call a good app. And uh, we started off with this kind of interview approach. We will try to elicitate their, their opinions and now it's more about sitting down with them and trying to create the app as well. So yeah. trying to take that approach of um, being part of their thinking as we see them doing things. So again, um, various people from various disciplines will call this differently. Um, I, I suppose engaged research is, is a good kind of overarching term for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, question very pertinent, uh, <laughs> of the, when we were trying to advertise this, we had to think the name of what we were going to call it, and why would you apply for a scheme in the first place? Um, and certainly when we looked at the, um, the uptake across the university, that people who actually applied for it, there are parts of the university who didn't, um, and I know they're doing great work, so they obviously didn't see it as applying to them, so, uh, so there's still a job for, to be done for us for that. So we've had an education of technologists, we've had an education of psychology researcher, and now we're going to move across the campus to environmental scientists, just to show those challenges in practice. Over to Emma. Thank you. Um, my name is Emma Rothrow, and I'm the Floodplain Meadows Partnership Outreach Coordinator, and I wanted to talk about the relationship between research, engagement, and impact using my project, the Floodplain Meadows Partnership, as a case study. So floodplain meadows, species which floodplain meadows are one of the most biodiverse habitats in the UK. They can have as many as 40 different plant species in just one meter square. And some of them are home to some very iconic and rare species, such as the snake's head fritillary that you can see in the corner. They have evolved through a long history of agricultural management, which basically means taking a hay cut once a year and following that up by aftermath grazing and on some sites that management has been going on for nearly a thousand years. They are now very rare, um, they're found on only about 1,200 hectares in the UK which is only about the size of Heathrow Airport in total. Of those um, sites there, five of them are designated under European legislation as being important across Europe and almost all of the rest of them are SSSIs or sites of special scientific interest and protected at a national level. They have declined by, it's an estimated, 98% in the last century. So they're a, very, a, a habitat of great concern. 
So they are biologically interesting, they are culturally interesting, they're very beautiful, um, but they're also very interesting from a research perspective. Um, and in 1999, um, a group of Open University grassland ecologists had a look at this habitat to see how it is that so many different species can all live in such a small space competing for the same resources. Um, and they had this paper published in Nature, um, which identified that the reason that they could do this was because they segregated out on the hydrological spectrum. So some plants liked it a bit wetter, some plants liked it a bit drier. And this was quite revolutionary at the time. Um, and this is an, just a very quick example of that. So um, this is part of the research that they found. These are three different species of the rose family, so in theory they should all have roughly the same requirements. But actually the research showed that um, Great Burnett at the bottom likes... Um, likes its hydrological regime to be slightly drier. It doesn't tolerate a huge amount of water logging, but it can tolerate a bit. Meadow sweet, somewhere in the middle, can tolerate a bit of drying and a bit of water logging. Uh, and silverweed, at the opposite end of the spectrum, at the top, can tolerate an awful lot of water logging and not very much soil drying. And so they're very subtly different and graded according to the, the soil water level that's on their site. And actually, that can only be as little as a difference of 10 centimetres. So it's a very subtle effect. So why are these habitats now so rare? Well, firstly, they've suffered from over-drainage and over-abstraction. Um, they've suffered from agricultural intensification. Um, and this site here is one of the most important in the UK, and it's surrounded by sites that are darker green that have been improved. But also, gravel extraction is encroaching here um, from the west. Uh, development, and this is a site in Milton Keynes, which used to be, obviously, surrounded by green fields. Um, and that was, even that picture was taken some years ago, and I think now all of those development sites are fully occupied. Um, the recent and increasing amount of summer flooding that we've been seeing has a, quite a devastating impact on the community. These habitats are evolved to cope with winter flooding, summer drying, occasional summer flooding, occasional winter drying. But where we're seeing the successive um, degree of summer flooding, it's a problem because it, re it results in um, plant and grass kill and it's difficult for them to recover from. Um, and interestingly, and perhaps most pertinently in a way, um, is differences in site management objectives. Many of these sites are owned by conservation organisations. Some of them have objectives that aren't focused on the plant communities. Um, so this is a site that used to be a species-rich meadow. It was managed to be wetter than is good for the plants that the OU research team established, and as a result lost its biodiversity in terms of its plants. There's now only two species of plant on this site where there used to be many. Um, because people didn't understand the importance of the soil water level for these very sensitive plants. So in about 2004, um, the Grasslands team were asked to contribute to uh, various policy documents, um, and their findings were rolled out to the national conservation organisations as best practice, trying to share some of this research to, to reach people on the ground. And as a result of that, the team were invited to many different sites to give advice um, and to help give advice based on research as to what site water levels should actually be to try and protect these important plant communities. And as a result of that, the nature conservation organisations that the team were talking to said, look, you're getting asked so many of the same questions, you need to set up a partnership. And that's what the Open University did. So the Floodplain Meadows Partnership was born in 2007, and the steering group were Environment Agency, the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, Natural England, the Field Studies Council, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and obviously the Open University who direct the partnership and host it. Um, and in 2008 succeeded in getting funding for a three-year project from the Esme Fairburn Foundation to employ a project officer, part of whom was myself and uh, partly uh, another colleague of mine. And we had three objectives. The first was to continue with our long-term monitoring on the key sites so that we can, could continue to feed into site management objectives on the ground. The second was to run a series of outreach and training activities to share or to specifically target the research findings with a, uh, a range of different stakeholders. And the third was to encourage the restoration of these habitats but also the monitoring of the restoration so that we could learn how the restoration projects are working. Um, so, that's the research. What did we do about communication? Um, I suppose that should also be engagement, really, because it wasn't just a one-way process, it never is. Um, we set up a website. Um, we ran a series of residential, professional and um, public workshops. We produced a newsletter, we designed web tools, leaflets, brochures for different sites. We run a conference once every three years. We've given an awful lot of um, 
face-to-face -face site visits. We've probably visited more than 70 sites across the UK in the last six years um, where we have given advice um, to, and, and had a look at what people were doing on their sites. And we've got involved with guided walks, hay festivals, open days, and done the usual kind of publicity stuff. And we're also... Um, Sorry, I'm catching up with myself. We're also um, involved in a citizen science project where we are um, inviting volunteers to come and actually um, collect scientific data on the snake's head fritillary and the bumblebees that pollinate them to try and understand that relationship better. So that's the communication side, the research side. Have, have we had any impact? Well, that is, it's already been said. It's very difficult sometimes to assess impact. Perhaps in environmental science, it's a little bit easier in that some of the things we do are quantifiable. Um, and I just want to list through three case studies to talk about impacts at different levels. Um, my first one is Chimney Meadows National Nature Reserve, which is quite a big floodplain meadow site in the Thames Valley. Um, it's owned by Bebout, that's the, the local wildlife trust. Um, and is a national nature reserve. And once upon a time, um, it looked like this. And then it was hit by the 2007, 2008 floods and ended up looking like this. So um, that's quite a devastating change. It looks like this because um, in the summer, if the water sits for a very long time, the hay rots, it falls over, an algal mat falls on, forms on the surface. When the waters finally drain away, you're left with this horrible rotting mess. And the research showed that that's a massive problem for the site and the species diversity because the nutrients from the hay don't get taken off to balance the nutrients that come in from the floods. Not only that, all of the material that rots down adds to the nutrient burden, it all goes back into the soil, and then you have a much reduced species diversity the following year. So in about 2011, we wrote an article in one of our newsletters called When Do You Cut a Meadow? Now, that might not sound very controversial, but actually it is quite controversial. Our advice is always to cut the hay as soon as it's ready and the weather is suitable so that the hay has the highest nutritive quality and is therefore the best for the farmer. But that also means that you take off the maximum amount of nutrients possible from the site, which balances your nutrient cycle nicely. Now, what had happened at Chimney was they hadn't been able to take the hay off. Um, their nutrient level had gone up and their species diversity had gone down and so um, the site manager Lisa Lane who we work with said um, she looked at our newsletter article and she went off and she built a barn um, and she bought in some hay equipment um, and she said we're not going to be behest to contractors who come and cut our hay we're going to do it ourselves using our own equipment when the hay is ready and she said so in terms of the knock-on from simply reading a newsletter and talking to staff at the floodplain meadows partnership we have substantially changed our practices here and it's made a huge difference so that's an example of impact in terms of behavior practice change my second case study is looking at a site called well drakings which is in the lower derwent valley in yorkshire um, it's just here. Um, and again, it's a very, well, not again, it's a controversial site because for many years it has been managed with its water levels slightly wetter than is good for the plant community. And so the bird people who would like to see it slightly wetter argue that that's what it should be. And the people who are perhaps more plant favoured say, well, we should, we should um, manage it a little bit um, drier for the plant community. And so for many years there was this debate about where the water levels should be set. Um, and in 2008, I think this trial started, the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust approached the partnership and said, well, can you give us some um, actual guidelines on what water levels we should use for the plant community that might not impact the bird community? And can you monitor the plant community? And we will monitor the bird community. And they got all the different people around the table and everyone signed up to that and the trial was carried out. Um, and we're now, we're now um, what is it, six years later, and we have some reporting for them. Um, and this graph shows, these are three different plant community areas on the site, but for all of them, you can see that the general trend in species number is up. There's a little blip last year, but the general trend is up, and they're all higher than they were to start off with. So I think we can record an impact there in terms of um, botanical diversity, which is a relief, I have to say. <laughs> Um, and finally, um, my third little case study, looking at the impact on public engagement specifically. Um, and this was looking at a, f uh, a project that was esteem funded starting in 2012, building on this long-term volunteer project we'd had running at North Meadow, counting snakes head fritillaries. And what esteem funded us to do was to set up two additional volunteer groups on two new sites using the same method that we were doing, and at the same time establish Bumblebee 
conservation bumblebee um, surveys to see if we could investigate the relationship between the two, because um, bumblebees are the snake's head fritillary's main pollinator. And in particular, what I esteem were keen to see us look at was how our volunteers had been engaged or impacted and how we kept the groups going over the period of time. Um, so in the winter we ran workshops, um, invited them all back, showed them the findings that they'd collected and asked them to feed into what questions they would next like answered. Um, and that seems to have built some really good small but good and committed volunteer groups. We sent out some questionnaires this year as part of the fertility um, surveying day. Um, and these are some of the things that we got back. Um, I want to become an ecologist, so I need all the experience I can. I don't have much botanical surveying skill, so this is an excellent opportunity while I was home to take part. So that's good. We've given someone an opportunity. Um, and then looking at the, the overall results from the other, um, the other questionnaires, 87.5% um, said they've improved their natural history recording skills, which is good. Um, 63.5% said they gained more knowledge of environmental and conservation issues. 53% uh, said they would consider getting involved in other aspects of the project, which is something I'm going to start chasing up, obviously, because I could do with as much help as I can get. And 57.1% um, said they'd found out more about the project. So I think, I think, you might disagree with me, that these are evidence of impact in terms of public engagement, which is much harder to quantify, as far as I can see, than the botanical and the um, behavioural change on site, because I can see those things and I can measure them. But I find that much more difficult. So in terms of quantifying impact, I think I'm probably just re-saying what I've just said. Questionnaires for volunteers, case studies, botanical surveys. Uh, we can do all those, and as a result of the award that we got last year, we now have a little bit more funding to look at um, some of the site visits that I said that we had undertaken in the last six years, conducting semi-structured interviews with... Um, with some of those participants in those site visits to see whether we can further quantify the, the impact that the project has had. Um, and some of that will enable us to follow up with some botanical survey work to see whether some of the advice we gave then has resulted in botanical change on the ground through behaviour, um, which is probably where I'm most interested in, really. Um, and I think that's probably it. I'd be very interested to know if anyone else has any other, the other suggestions for assessing impact. Um, and this is just the, the team of the Floodplain Meadows Partnership, David Going, who is our project director, um, and our website, floodplainmeadows.org.uk. Thank you very much. My question, one or two. Can I ask one? Yeah, question. Cool. So you um, I mean, you've outlined a fantastic range of activity, do you know what I mean, over a long period of time. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the team, you know, you've given us the team there, you know, how did that kind of come about? Do you feel like you've got all the expertise within that team you need, or are there kind of gaps, do you think? <laughs> oh, there's always gaps, aren't there? You, kind of, you, know, you, you talked a bit about how you kind of assess impact, you know, and how challenging that can be in places. I'm just wondering if you could say a bit about that, do you know what I mean? Because you've been trying to do that within your role, and I don't think that's where you started out, was it, do you know what I mean? No, my role is to manage the project and communicate with people and run the courses and, and all of that. And so this, this engaging impact stuff has come latterly to, to us as a project. That's, that's absolutely not what we were set up to do, other than we want to see impact on the ground. So right from the beginning, the partnership was set up to deliver impact, but it wasn't set up to understand. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because what we're all interested in is seeing how the plant communities change, and that requires behaviour change in many cases. Um, so we were kind of instinctively doing it, but not actually looking at that recording process. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, my, I mean, my background is from a, um, from, a, from a conservation manager's perspective. I'm not an academic. I used to work for the Environment Agency giving advice on um, um, the assessment of flood alleviation schemes on nature conservation, for example. So I was very much from the impact end of things the team here are very much from the academic end of things, but their motivation is very much about impact as well. So I suppose, in a way, we were already doing that, um, and then the partnership being set up and our steering group requiring us to be delivering impact um, has meant that it's always gone that way. I mean, impact is not the most popular, I think we could probably agree on that. Um, do you think it's been beneficial for the research project as a whole? some of the evidence you collected, which perhaps you wouldn't have collected if it hadn't been there? Um, well, yes. Yes. I mean, certainly in terms of um, 
getting more um, involvement from our steering group partners, they're very keen to see impact, and so measuring impact for them is a really, really important. And they're, our, you know, they're effectively our objective setters. Um, our funders really want to see impact and quantifying impact, so you know, that helps for us to get more funding. Um, and clearly, as we're a case study in the REF, that's, that's beneficial for us. So yeah, I mean, uh, from my point of view, impact is no kind of, there's no argument about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, okay. Then we're going to move back across the campus, and uh, we're in our next presentation, and I'll hand you over to John. Uh, thanks, uh, Rick and everyone, for the invitation to, um, to talk with you. I'm going to talk a bit about building on history, um, which uh, was a knowledge uh, exchange project. Um, it was actually uh, a month ago we heard it had been nominated for a Times Higher Award uh, in the Outreach Initiative of the Year category, so we're really excited about that and, and fingers crossed for, uh, for next month. One thing I wanted to try and get across at the, at the beginning of this presentation is just how much fun uh, Building on History was as a project. Um, there are occasional kind of groans, aren't there, when words like impact are mentioned. Uh, but, uh, like, personally, I found it a really enriching um, experience. What I would like to do is talk um, in three areas. Firstly, about the, um, the project itself, the kind of practicalities of the project, if you like. Then about some of its impacts uh, and outputs. And then, at the end, some of the broader uh, lessons that, that I've learned as a researcher that might be useful to others as well. Uh, Building on History was funded by the Arts and Humanities <coughs> Research Council. Uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of emphasis amongst historians about the desirability of having a more historically informed public. And Building on History, I guess, was um, trying to provide one answer to the question, um, what is, who needs religious history? What is the use of religious history? So we wanted to engage publics particularly members of specific religious traditions in London, with recent scholarly research on, on religious history. We wanted them to help them to understand something of the history of religion in London, but also to engage and to participate in that religious history. The project was led by Professor John Wolfe, uh, who's also in religious studies, and I was the research associate for the, the first three years of the project, and then co I uh, for a, a follow-on project, which was also called Building on History. Uh, phase one of the project uh, involved the OU, King's College London was the other main academic partner, uh, Lambeth Palace Library, which is the main uh, national repository of the archives of the Church of England, and then the main public stakeholder was the Anglican Diocese of London, so a very kind of specific institution that we were working with. Uh, phase two, very much built on the approach uh, that we developed during phase one. Uh, this time we worked with Royal Holloway University of London. Uh, and the approach uh, to working with public stakeholders was more organic, a bit more, uh, le less formalised. So we were working with various groups and in in individuals within highly diverse religious traditions, including Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, Roman Catholic, Black Majority Church, Jewish and Muslim constituencies. The project had three main objectives. The first was uh, to work with the, within these religious traditions to enhance their sense of kind of historical intelligence, if you like, to try and tune their, uh, their, their ante antennae to understand something of their own religious uh, history. Uh, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, said uh, rather tantalisingly in 2005 that when contemporary churches look at church history, they may discover a sense of recognition, anxieties in common. And what we wanted to do with Building on History was to work with contemporary religious practitioners to enable them to understand more of their recent history in London in ways that would impact the way they operated and understood themselves in the present. The, um, the second objective was to not only work, I guess, uh, specifically 
with particular traditions, but was to develop spaces for intra and inter religious discussion and learning uh, about London's uh, religious diversity. Um, and I think this was one of the unique aspects of the project, that we were able to open up these spaces where very diverse constituencies were able to come together and talk about something, uh, often something which they had in common. Um, so particularly in phase two of the project, those in common in sh and shared experiences of being a migrant in London, the, the challenge of finding, the historical challenge of finding places in which to, to worship, or the, uh, the, the in common experience of, of, of prejudice. Um, so that was a really interesting aspect of, of, of the project. We also wanted to point towards histories that are perhaps um, counterintuitive at a first glance, or hidden histories. So for example, histories of, um, of, of cooperation. Um, and so for example, with the East London Mosque, uh, one of our co-eyes had, had recently published a history of the East London Mosque. And one of the interesting aspects of that history was the role of Nathaniel Mayer, who was the first Lord of Rothschild, uh, in financing uh, and, and uh, being part of that, the East London Mosque Committee when it was originally set up. Uh, the third objective was to widen participation in local religious history. Uh, we did this in a number of ways. We prepared online research guides for someone who wanted to, for example, research the history of their, of their church or their mosque uh, or, or place of worship. Uh, we work with various secondary schools uh, on pilot projects on, on the history of religious diversity in that area. So, for example, with one um, school, Christchurch School in, in Hampstead, uh, teachers there develop projects from uh, kids in reception to year six on, um, on using the local church building as a, as a resource for learning. So that was not only to do with uh, religious education, if, if you like, but also uh, using the building for geography and maths, counting things, mapping things. And all the, the outputs from that are available online so that other teachers can, can look at some of that material if they're interested. Um, okay, outputs and, and, and impacts. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a few highlights of these. Uh, one is uh, increased grassroots engagement in religious history. Um, and I think a good example of that is, is the East London Mosque, which was one of the, the stakeholders in phase two of the project. Um, they're now one of the first mosques, perhaps the, f no, perhaps the first mosque actually in the UK, to develop their own on-site archive. And I, I think being involved in the project helped them to develop their bid um, to, to put that together. Uh, we work closely with the National Archives in phase two of the project, and they've now developed guidelines for both mosques and black majority churches uh, um, to help them develop their kind of historical infrastructure, if you like. So uh, in areas like archiving or uh, gathering um, oral uh, history uh, perspectives from um, first generation pioneers and so on. And I think there's a real sense that the project was timely, particularly for those two communities. Um, I've got a quote here from Jamil Sharif, um, who um, heads up the Research and Documentation Committee for the Muslim Council of Britain. And he said, I think the project has been very timely for the Muslim community, in that there is a young movement st starting of awareness of religious archives and the importance of oral history as the earlier set of pioneers are gradually fading away. And I think the project was really timely because of that. Uh, secondly, I think we've had some impact uh, on, the, um, on some of the larger institutions with which we worked. For example, the Diocese of London. They have now um, placed um, the, something called the history audit in their strategy for the diocese. So that is something that we developed with, with the diocese, which enables uh, a local congregation to think about its history and to think about it in ways which might help them understand long-term patterns, historical patterns, specific to that congregation, uh, to help them um, to uh, reconsider, perhaps, the ways in which they do things in the present. Uh, thirdly, there have been the school's pirate projects, which I think have been fairly innovative, and the resources from them are available online. And fourthly, we've talked a bit already today about these 
this problem, well not problem, but the, the, this whole thing of intangible benefits. And I think as an art project, this, th this project really, some of its most significant impacts I think are probably intangible at the moment. And we need to be asking questions about impacts probably 5, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, this is a project that was very much based uh, about, around issues of identity, self-understanding. It's difficult to measure that kind of thing. Uh, so I hope there's, there's probably more sympathy for that problem in this room than anywhere else. You know. um, and... Uh, Finally, I, th I think another out an impact uh, which we, we hope will, um, will um, be a really positive thing over the next few years is the project has helped us to identify new research questions by engaging with these communities, uh, having a, a clearer understanding uh, of them and some of the themes and issues that they are interested in. That, that has helped um, myself and, and, and John Wolfe, I think, to think more uh, specifically about future research questions and we're, we're about to apply to the AHRC uh, for a networking uh, bid grant which will, will deal with some of the issues that we've come across during the course of this project. Um, so um, finally, what, what lessons have I learned as, as a researcher? Obviously every project is difficult so I'm not um, I'm not sure how, how useful these lessons will be to, to other projects, but, but here we go. Uh, firstly, uh, I think we learned quite quickly the importance of going with the flow. Uh, when you put a bid together, as you all know, you tend to have these specific aims and objectives and a rather structured project, which I think is a good thing because it gives you focus. But we found during the course of, the pro of this project that different opportunities open up. Uh, it take, the project takes you in ways that you didn't expect to, that, that might become most fruitful and more fruitful. And I think to kind of leave space within a project to follow those up and not to feel completely bound to you know, the structure it can be a, re a really good thing. We found that with the school's work, for example. We, we didn't think that, that was going to become a major part of the project, and it did. Uh, secondly, um, so important to build up kind of key relationships with, with stakeholders. Um, with our project, we found that there were gatekeepers for specific communities. That it was so important that we developed um, strong relationships built on, on trust with them because they were able to provide us with access to, to certain groups, certain communities uh, that otherwise it would have been really difficult to engage with. So th those relationships, those personal relationships and trust, I think, are, re are really uh, key to this kind of research. Um, thirdly, I, I was really interested in the last presentation, that kind of roster of partnerships. Uh, and, and I think th those kinds of dynamic partnerships bring a lot to the project. Our, our, our main partnership was with uh, Lambeth Palace Library and then kind of less formally with the National Archives and they really brought expertise that otherwise we wouldn't have had. So I think th those kinds of, of partnerships are really uh, important. And um, fourthly, the very obvious point that I've just found this engaging research process to be a two-way street. Um, it has impacted the way in which I think about my own research, the kinds of research questions I ask as a historian. It's brought me into contact with archive material otherwise I would not have known existed. Uh, so it's been very beneficial uh, from that point of view as well. And as a, and as a northerner, uh, it's been really... I, I the, 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 map of, the tube map of London used to be a complete mystery to me. And I now feel as if I understand how London works and where things are in a way that I didn't before. Thanks. Um, how did you actually start building those relationships? What did you physically do? So, phase one of the project was um, we kind of, well, John Wolfe, who, who devised the project, knew, I think, a few individuals within the Diocese of London who had an interest in history, an academic interest in history, who were also um, involved in, in the running of the diocese. Uh, so the Archdeacon of Charing Cross, uh, Bill Jacob, who's a very well-known historian in his circle, and, but also has a, a key role in the diocese. 
So he, he was a key person in the first phase of the project. We then found that sometimes we were quite deliberate in phase two of identifying potential partners, potential individuals we could talk to. But it also happened quite organically. I saw, I remember um, Jamil Sharif, who I mentioned there, who uh, was really key in helping us to engage with some of the Muslim communities in London. He just happened to be at uh, London Metropolitan Archives uh, seminar that I was speaking at. And I was talking about the Diocese of London, and I think he thought some of this could be really interesting for the East London Mosque. Um, so some of it was quite deliberate, some of it was organic and by chance even. What was your desired impact? impact? I mean, like, you talked about the impact going a lot. You talked about um, providing them with information and that they would change how they act at the moment. But what, if you could tie that back to like a real situation, how is it you wanted them to change? What kind of behaviour did you want them to change? I don't think, we weren't really thinking in terms of changing behaviour. But I think we were thinking, you know, these are... Um, key community institutions um, have important community roles. So there's a real, the, these groups should be historically informed uh, and should be able to contextualise something of the present by understanding the past was a kind of a, a, a general good we thought that the project should promote. And it was, it was as we got into the project that we began to think more specifically about impacts. Um, and so, for example, the history audit approach, that idea of working with individual congregations and places of worship, was something that I think only came to light when we began to talk more with people on the ground and to understand what would be useful to, to them. Um, so I, I think, particularly with the first project, there were kind of general ambitions for the project that became more specific as, we, as, we, as it went along. host of faculties on the campus. We have one more faculty who's going to come along. Uh, we've dealt with supporting children who want to do research, supporting children who want to learn how to read, supporting conservation, um, and building on history. Um, what we haven't done <laughs> is looked at a social science perspective. And uh, I'm delighted Jackie Gabb's going to come along and talk about a uh, project she's been working on, which is funded by the ESRC, which she's worked on with uh, Janet Fink. And I hope I'm not being too unfair by saying that they asked a, a rather simple question but did some lovely research around it, which is, why does love endure? <laughs> Jackie Gabb. And there's no PowerPoint, so you just get to look at me. <laughs> um, OK, in the project, it, it was a medium-sized project funded by the Econoc Economic and Social Research Council. And in terms of doing grants, I mean, quite often we, ha we have a kind of interesting research question, we have an idea that we fancy looking at, and then we go about, we write a proposal, and then you research the, the question, you look at the social phenomenon, whatever, and you find some findings and then you move on. And myself and Janet decided we wanted to do it slightly differently to that. And that's partly um, through past experience, but also this idea of um, engaged research. We wanted to do something which we have called dialogic from the outset. So it's a dialogic project in the sense, before we did anything, we set up a meeting with a whole lot of people, different stakeholders, different partners, who we thought had an investment in this area of long-term couple relationships. And everyone came around and there were lots of tea, cake, and I like cake, so there was lots of cake and lots of conversation. And we started saying, you know, well, what are the sort of questions that you're interested in? And they were key relationship support organisations, they were um, Department for um, Health, they were um, Department of Pensions, Treasury, um, various stakeholders from other sectors, um, trade union organisations. They, they were a very diverse audience. And we just had a conversation with them and said, what do you want to know? What are your questions? And if we start from that point, how would that feed into building a research proposal? 
And it didn't mean we had a top-down agenda from, you know, what are this third sector and governmental organisations, what do they want to know? But it's what do they want to know and how does that speak to what we wanted to know and what we in, were interested in? Because we do have different perspectives as social scientists. So after talking to those individuals and talking to those organisations, we then set up writing the um, project proposal. And that in itself was a dialogic process. We had a whole group which was funded very clearly by the Open University. It was set up through um, a project by our previous Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, which was the Intimate Futures Research Project. And that had about um, £50,000 worth of funding to fund several research projects. And so you've got this synthesis of different research projects coming together, this group of cross-faculty individuals all talking, all looking at the different proposals that we were generating and putting forward grant proposals from that. So it was a hugely rich process from day one. We're delighted to say it got funded, um, got very positive reviews. and. Before we then started the research project again, rather than thinking, right, now we know all the questions, we're going to go out and research, the first six months was spent talking to all of those partners and stakeholders again. So doing formal interviews with them and saying, OK, what are your research agendas now? What are you interested in? What are the key questions that you're inter interested in, for example, at Relate? Big relationships, the biggest relationship support organisation. What do you want to know to help your service delivery? in the um, Department for Education. What do you want to know in terms of supporting um, relationships because they're pumping in millions of pounds every year? The Treasury, what is your bottom line? Why do you want this research to take part? So we had all of those interviews. We listened to what people thought. We thought about the policy context, the social context. We then devised a survey. And six months in, we're starting about the research process. So the research um, survey then went live. And by that time already, there was such a high level of interest, the project literally flew. So we thought, in our wildest fantasies, we'd get about 50, 100. When I had my little fantasy moments, 500 surveys would be completed. And we ended up with 5,500. And that's because suddenly it captured a moment. Now, you can say it's a moment that, and I have been said you know, several times to me, well, it's an easy sell. A couple of relationships, everyone wants to know about it. You can also say it's a really tired and overdone subject, and who really cares? So it goes both ways. Yes, it's easy sell in one way. But on the other, actually saying, we're going to do something which has academic integrity, which gives research evidence, which isn't sexy, isn't going to be soundbite driven, actually had its own challenges. So the media picked up on it from day one, and part of our task when we were delivering the project was actually sitting on the media and saying, we're not going to give you evidence right until the end, funnily enough, when we've done the research, when we have the data, when we've done the analysis. So there was a two-tier process. Halfway through the project, we finished the survey. We did the analysis of the survey, and then we had further conversations with all of the media people we'd set in place. From the beginning, because it was evident that there was going to be a large media presence, we developed close relationships with an external partner who is an individual who writes a lot of relationship handbooks, and that was Susan Quilliam. An internal partner in the social sciences called Med Barker, who does a lot of blogging and really loves the social media side of things and um, also the media comms department um, within the university more generally. So we had that as a, as a sort of the, the, the baseline to support us and partly fend off media inquiries, but also to make sure that we were all trained as individuals in the research team to deal with those media inquiries, but also to help us formulate what are the messages, what are the key messages we want to get out there when we're talking about our findings. So when it came to the survey findings, they were a year before we finished the qualitative data, because it was a two-year project. Susan and Meg were very crucial for us in terms of getting that message out there, in terms of making sure that we had credibility within the wider academic community and within the, the main popular press and all of the relationship key organisations. So we, in a way, had this multi-tiered approach to stakeholders, to a media dissemination strategy, and most projects don't set up a media dissemination strategy group. We did from the very beginning. And I think those things were really useful in terms of going forward, of thinking about what is public engagement and what is impact. 
So all the survey findings went live, massive media interest, which was fantastic. We then just kept saying, we're not going to give you much more until the end, stick with us. And we just kept putting a lid on it. And part of that is that pressure cooker effect. By the time you then release your findings, there's like a clamour. And it really did feel like a clamour by the end. And so we decided to scale up our launch of findings. And we did a big event at the British Library, which we you know, had capacity audience all of media, all over it, went on BBC television the morning of the um, um, event, massive amount of media coverage. I mean, the, the, the media comms department here ended up doing a, a report on how much coverage we had, and we had a, a vast amount of media coverage in terms of um, advertising equivalent value. So it hit a lot of the headlines. And we had headlines which were bizarre in the sense of in the Chinese press, they reported that British people prefer sex to a um, prefer, sorry, they don't. British people prefer a cup of tea to sex. Our findings didn't say that. There is one little bit of data which does point to that. But the point is it was coverage. And it was actually good coverage. We got absolutely not a bit of bad coverage. We got a few digs like, you know, are we really putting half a million pounds into finding out a cup of tea makes a relationship? But actually most of it was really robust once you got behind the headlines. So in terms of researchers, what we learned is you just have to swallow the headlines. Because at first, we got really protective and sat on every headline and made it have integrity and be robust. And in the end, we, we learned quite quickly. You let them have the headline. You just make sure the substance is valuable. And actually, once we learned that, it went very well. So the Chinese press, for example, was very positive. New York Times, similarly. similarly. Um, Another, you know, the gay press reported lots on the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer contingent in, in the sample. So each, each paper, each market had its own little perspective and targeted what they wanted to cover in the findings, but they all did cover it very well. And what we did through that process, and again, talking to all our partner organisations, I've spoken at the Relate Annual Conference, for example, which is all the councillors um, who go there for their annual kind of get-together and skills update. I've talked to them three times now. And what we're doing is building up a very strong relationship. So what they've now got to inform uh, counselling and relationship support services is research evidence. And that might sign, sound like, well, surely we've got lots of research evidence. Before we did the study, there was actually no research evidence on how couples sustained their relationships. We just knew loads about why people break, broke up. We knew what the stresses were. So what this did was completely different take, turned it on its head. And so those relationship organisations really want to know what are people doing so that when they have people who come into the counselling context, they can say, well, have you thought of these small momentary intersection, interventions? So for example, the study shows that actually, you know, the grand big bunch of flowers from Interflora, or we've called them the guilty petrol station bunch of flowers, isn't going to work. It helps in the immediate. And I do hasten to say, some of us do like flowers. So it isn't don't give flowers, but that isn't going to help a relationship sustain. What helps a relationship to sustain, for example, are very small, mundane, ordinary little things like the cup of tea in bed might be weekly, might be daily, might be however often works, but it's whatever works for that particular relationship. And it's also recognizing, we've said couple diversity right from the very beginning, and people thought we meant by that, you know, well, some people are, you know, same-sex relationships, or it might be older and younger, or parenting and non-parenting. And the, the markers of difference are not those big demographic markers that you might expect. The markers are some people like a cup of tea, other people like taking the dog for a walk, other people like unloading a dishwasher. The markers are different and individual to each of those couples. So what we're finding, it's just actually learning about that couple intimate knowledge. It's learning what works for that individual and that individual relationship and then investing in that, whatever that might mean. So it isn't this compulsion for disclosure and to talk about everything. For a lot of our couples, it's don't talk very much at all, and that's the way to go. The relationship practices that work, that were holding couples together, I found something surprising, couples dancing. I never knew couples danced at home, because I didn't do it. My family didn't do it, my friends didn't do it. I now find out lots of people dance in their kitchen, in their living room, and it's just a joy or it's a moment of sensual intimacy, or if there's perhaps mental health issues or something that's making someone feel really fed up, it's a way of cheering people up. 
I didn't know those small things, and it isn't just me who didn't know. We've got the whole counselling fraternity who didn't know either. So what we're being able to feed in is this research evidence of what are the things that people are doing. We're going into the research uh, the, the uh, support organisations, talking to policy briefings. We've talked now within the Labour policy briefing. We're talking to the Coalition Development of Policy. The Relationship Alliance brings together all of the relationship support organisations. We're now working with them so we can feed into that sort of block of relationship support organisations. Um, we get approached by organisations like the Family Planning Association to work with them to develop relationship education resource. So we're now going to be working with them to develop um, a pack for young people because in Wales, um, uh, sex and relationship education is compulsory. So we'll be going into schools and working with those communities to actually deliver some research evidence-based instruction on sexual and relationship education. And so doing a project like this has actually enabled us to just snowball and snowball and then, of course, do further and further research. But actually the impact and the public engagement just gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more you do. So we've just finished writing the academic book and now suddenly we're going straight into writing a trade book or a handbook which will be targeted at the relationship support communities but also for individuals, general readership. And that's because press come to us and say, will you write it? So there's so much interest by generating, you know, this is a really interesting message, we actually get approached to do the things rather than us initiating it. So in the end, for us, it's just been holding tight onto it so it doesn't overtake every dimension of our lives as a project, rather than thinking, how can we do public engagement or how can we do impact? It's actually just saying, how can we hold on to it and do it very well in terms of evidence, blah, um, that's much, much harder. And in a way, I am, whilst I know, you know, in terms of ESRC or in terms of um, REF, we've got to care, actually that's less of my concern at the moment. When I speak to a, a guy on the market on the weekend and he said, oh, I saw this really interesting piece in the paper the other day about making a cup of tea. And I make my wife a cup of tea and breakfast in bed every Sunday. And actually for me, that's the evidence. The message is getting out there. Whether we can actually quantify that will be a bigger challenge. And I put my hands up, we haven't actually started to do that yet. Thank you. you, you I, mean, you, I think you saw some of this coming, <laughs> just, just the size and the scale of it. Because you, know, you, 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 know, you had many people like Maggie Bolt yeah. from the early start. Um, I just wondered if you had any advice for somebody who's starting out and maybe thinking, okay, what if this goes huge, you know, and what, what would be your kind of top tips for somebody starting out as a researcher and saying, okay, you need to factor at least some of this in and say, you know, what happens if, A, the project gets funded, which we know is challenging enough as it is, but if it does and then it gets huge, how would you deal with that? Um, well, we had a team of people and we call them partners, we call them colleagues, you know, whether there's a formal relationship. And so, for example, Meg did all of our blogging. I don't blog. I know I should. I don't Twitter, I, I, you know, whatever, tweet. Um, I know I should, but there are so many hours in the day. So what we had is a team of people where people did different parts of it. So that dimension I didn't need to personally do because I had a colleague who loves doing all of that, does it really well. And so now I am working with Meg and, and Janet and Susan to write the trade book. So it is about bringing those collaborations together in different ways, that you have this network of people. I think it's also being realistic about what you can achieve. And for us, faculty was fantastic. Faculty of Social Sciences was fantastic and just helped us as well. So with the end event, you know, literally is funding those sort of big splash events because they are very expensive to host. So it's having that team, but it's all, and also, you know, in the media comms department here, um, you know, just saying there are two great people we work with very closely, they field the media. So what I get is an email from them, and sometimes from media directly, but a lot of the time it's fielded. So it's having that infrastructure around the project so that things are handled for you. It's like having a PA almost, but, you know, but that really worked. It did really work. And having a media strategy right from day one, we had a media strategy. So 
Did, was, was Meg part of your like, initial bid? Or was she sort of no, afterwards? no. Okay. Um, Meg was part of the dissemination media strategy group that we set up with her and Susan mm. because that's what she was interested in. So in a way, the secondary analysis of the data, once we've got them, Meg's investment was always in the outputs of the end product because of her counselling practice. Mm. But also things like one of the methods we used was an emotion map method where um, which has now gone into the counseling room and again makes a counselor so actually using some of the methods and the tools that we developed in the project in that counseling context so actually that's been really important so you know the benefits that individuals get may not be instantly recognizable but it's also you know those collaborations are strong we now happily put a bit in together later down the line so it, it is that sort of investment year on year really I, mean, I love your methods, I think they're really clever. We haven't had a chance to talk about them here, so I'll start the conversation now. But I, I think, yeah, that is a legacy, it's another strand of your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, just a couple of minutes from me, and then uh, we can go and get a cup of tea. Um, so Eileen asked uh, earlier on about uh, this question of what do you call this <laughs> set of practices, you know, and uh, I think our speakers today have illustrated just the diversity in how people approach these kind of types of research. Um, different people, different aims and objectives, different contexts, different processes. So we, we've tried to kind of encapsulate that in the way that we wrote the original scheme so that we could allow people to, to buy into that. But as I say, I think we had some success in that just in the sense that we had you know, four or five different academic areas certainly represented within, within the awards, but there were some missing as well. So we've still got a bit of a job to do there. Now, I think the other thing which is kind of really important to note about the, the seven projects and different individuals you see on that picture there um, is that as the Catalyst project, we didn't really have an intervention on those projects at all, really. Um, certainly, I'd spoken a bit with Emma and David about floodplain meadows and Joe Smith about creative climates, but really, actually, all this work was ongoing without any intervention from the Catalyst, so this, this stuff was, was already out there. What we're trying to do is build, if you like, our pool of expertise in this kind of area and also to celebrate it as we go forward. So we're launching our second uh, round of this award scheme I'm certainly hoping that uh, some of our winners uh, of this scheme will be able to act as judges on the second scheme. So I'll send you out on a separate invitation there. I won't put you on the spot now. Um, but just to build that kind of community of practice in this kind of work. So the, uh, the second scheme is where the first one was on the, on the blog there. Um, I know everybody that's left here is actually an award winner pretty much, so you're not really interested. But I know there's a lot of people that are actually listening in externally, so I'm more saying this for them, really. Um, so say, the, the second scheme is there. Um, we've refined our definition of engaged research following the first scheme and following some discussions with researchers from across the university. So um, this definition here uh, was approved by the Open University at Research Committee in July. So if you like, this is now an official OU definition for engaged research. Um, and crucially and interestingly, um, it doesn't contain the word public. Um, so we took that out because it seemed to be so problematic for people. Um, so we used the term stakeholders, but then we defined stakeholders in a kind of very kind of inclusive way. With this idea that people can be involved throughout the whole process, I think it's been illustrated in, uh, in some depth by the, sort of by the talks we've had today. So the scheme's now open. It's open to all active open university researchers. In the first scheme, we had a set of categories for what we were going to award prizes to. Uh, this time round, we've taken all those away just to make it, I hope, obvious that everybody can apply uh, from a postgraduate researcher to a prof and anybody in between. Um, so on the blog here, we list the eligibility, we include the entry form, and crucially this time round, we included the assessment criteria because um, people were asking us, OK, how do you know what's good? Um, how do you know what we should apply to? Um, how are you going to mark this? So we thought, okay, we'll just put the assessment criteria up there. People can look at it. So, um, so they're up there. Closing date is 18th of December um, with a view to having the awards ceremony in early February. Um, we've got that ball booked in now. So 
I'm hoping people will apply. Um, there are contact details for myself and Fiona on the, on the blog if anybody wants to get in touch with us. We wish you well in, in applying and uh, I think that's probably it for now. We'll say goodbye. And have a cup of tea. <laughs>